building your own PC can be an intensely daunting task. However, with the right resource and the right equipment, it can also be intensely rewarding. My name is Josh, and with the help of some of my colleagues here at JW Computers, we're going to be running through a quick build and showing you some of the common mistakes that people make on their first time building a PC. Just a heads up, this video is aimed at people that have at least a basic understanding of computer components. If you're not as confident, we are going to be doing a short series called Masterclass Mondays that'll go a bit more in-depth into all of these components and their feature set. That'll be releasing very shortly, so keep an eye on our YouTube channel for that. The first issue that many first-time builders will encounter is case compatibility, specifically relating to a lot of the size of your components. This can lead to frustrating issues where you'll have a component that's simply too large to fit in your case, or you could also go the opposing way, which is a silly mistake I made with my first PC. When you go with a significantly larger case, but a significantly smaller component, you end up with a lot of dead space in your computer that just looks a bit silly. A perfect example of this is something I've dealt with a fair bit while I'm in stores. Customers go out and buy the highest end graphics card they can, take it home, only to find that their graphics card won't physically fit in their case. I've seen many a case meet the hacksaw or the angle grinder in the quest for those extra frames per second and make that compatibility fit. It. However, it's the best thing to avoid that starting off. Thankfully, a lot of your case manufacturers will provide us with the tools to make sure that these issues aren't apparent for us. Cases are traditionally listed by the size of the motherboard that will physically fit inside of it, and that'll either be listed as ATX, Micro ATX, or ITX. To ensure that our motherboard will physically fit, we'll also have a look as our sizing on our motherboards are also listed as ATX, Micro ATX, or ITX. If we buy an MATX case, for example, we can fit an MATX motherboard or an ITX, the size down. If we buy an ATX case, we can fit an ATX, MATX, or ITX in there. Other things we're going to have to keep in mind when we're looking at our case sizing is the height of our CPU cooler, if we're going with an air cooler, size of our liquid cooler, if we're going with a liquid cooler, or the length of our graphics card. All of this information will be found on the manufacturer's page and it's very, very heavily recommended that you check the sizing compatibility on the case in relation to the components that you're looking at purchasing before you purchase them. Since we're on the topic of cases, another thing we'll have a quick look at is fan placement. This is another rookie mistake that people make and this can sometimes cause issues of massive dust buildup or you can sometimes have overheating issues. To keep all our components happy, healthy and running cool, we'll run through a couple quick tips just in regards to getting everything optimal. This is something I can explain over and over, but the best way is to visualize this. However, thankfully I've got an amazing colleague that's going to give you a very quick visual demonstration on one of the cases we've got here. Our traditional setup is intake fans at the front, which draws our cool air in. And then at the top and the rear of the case, we'll have our exhaust fans, which is bringing our naturally rising hot air out and accelerating that natural process. If you're unsure of which direction the airflow is traveling, you can have a quick look at the bracketry around the fan. There sometimes will be a little arrow that'll point your direction of travel. However, another little handy tip is X is for your exhaust, and that is traditionally the rear of the fan. So we've chosen all of our components, we've got them all unboxed and they're sitting in front of us. Where the heck do we start? First of all, I'd recommend have a quick look at our motherboard. If we've got a separate IO shield, what I'd highly recommend is install that into the back of the case immediately. If you're a frequenter of Reddit like I am, you see a lot of the Builder PC subreddits or PC Master Race subreddits, it's a common issue that people incur and it's a very annoying error to fix up later on down the line. So knocking it out of the way straight away eliminates one of our rookie mistakes. We've got our IO shield installed on our motherboard, but don't get too far ahead of yourself. What I'd highly recommend is grab your motherboard, put it on the motherboard box and use that as our nice little anti-static workbench. From there, it's a lot easier for us to install components like our processor, our memory and our solid state drive into that motherboard while it's outside of the case. It saves a lot of cut up fingers and a lot of swearing. Installing your processor. You want a heart attack? This is the part of the computer that you're going to have a bit of a stress point about. Installing the processor on the motherboard can be a very daunting task. However, with a bit of patience, steady hand, you should be perfectly fine. All of your processors will have a small golden triangle to dictate which direction matches up, and that golden triangle will also be mirrored on the motherboard to ensure that those two are lined up. The recommended process is don't touch the underside of the processor, hold from both sides, gently lower into the CPU socket. Once you're confident in its placing, traditionally put one finger on top and just give it a little wiggle side to side to ensure it's sitting 100%. Then we can put our locking clips down and we're all good to go. Heart attack avoided, you did well, good job. We've got all our other components installed on our motherboard, but let's not install it into the case just yet. A good tip is always confirm that your standoffs, which sit your motherboard off from the case, are installed A, in the correct positions, and B, all present. Knowing which standoffs need to be used can sometimes be a bit confusing. First resource we need to take advantage of will be the case manual. So if we pull that out, it'll traditionally dictate which standoffs need to be installed in which location, depending on what motherboard you've chosen. For example, if you've chosen an ATX motherboard, traditionally we'll need nine standoffs for the nine screw holes on the motherboard. If we go with an MA ATX motherboard will traditionally need eight standoffs for the eight screw holes on that motherboard. Once you've got all the standoffs installed, what I would highly recommend is sit your motherboard roughly above the area and just ensure that all of them line up to ensure that they're making correct contact and they're not going to cause any shorts on the back of your board. You bought yourself a mad cooler. Congratulations, it's going to look awesome inside your case. 
One thing before you install onto your processor, please ensure that the plastic peel that protects the copper on the part of the cooler is removed. This is a mistake I've made many a time and it's very frustrating. However, we all make mistakes, so it's okay. Something I've seen all too much, which is definitely a pain in the butt to clean up afterwards, is people using the entire tube of thermal paste. Highly don't recommend it. I'll get my colleague to insert a video of how much is too much. <coughs> For our standard systems, traditionally what we run is something around the size of a pea in the center of the processor. Once we attach the cooler, the force of the cooler applying will spread that thermal paste out evenly, and that should work perfectly fine for most applications. Everybody likes shiny new components. However, sometimes it's best for our wallet not to have a heart attack, and instead we'll reuse some of the components in our previous system. That's what we call an upgrade. If, for example, say we've got a new power supply that we've just purchased, and we want to replace the one that's currently in our system. If both of those power supplies are modular, it is always recommended to remove all of the previous power supply cables and use the ones that come in Included with your brand new one. With a lot of these brands, these are not interchangeable and they will cause fire if you try and use them. So don't, just don't. It's not worth it. So it's all together. It's sitting in front of you. Your palms are sweaty, your knees weak, and your arms are heavy, but you've done it. You've built your PC. You reach up in anticipation, about to hit the power button. It doesn't turn on. You probably forgot to turn the switch on on the back. It's okay, it happens. Flick that switch, then hit the power button again. You see all the pretty lights light up. It looks like a unicorn's taking a shit in your house. I can't say that. <laughs> There's a UFO taking off, but you've done it. You've built a computer. You see those fancy words, American mega trends. You've done it, congratulations. However, there's a couple quick things we'll run through just to make sure the computer's running 100%. While it looks very scary, we always recommend performing a BIOS update on the system. What that's doing is updating the basic firmware of your motherboard to ensure that maximum compatibility and all noted errors are corrected. If you're unsure how to do that, have a quick look at your motherboard manufacturer's website. They'll traditionally have a nicely worded procedure that runs you through all of the steps. Once everything's all updated, you're about to install Windows. One last setting I'd always recommend turning on is enabling either the XMP or the Expo profile on your motherboard. Traditionally, this will be found on the main page. What this is doing is essentially allowing your memory to run at its maximum rated speed. This obviously allows us to get what we paid for and make sure that we get those extra frames. Once we've got our system powering on, we mightn't be getting a display on the screen. There's no need to stress, one of the common mistakes that a lot of people will make is plugging their video cable into the wrong location. For systems with a dedicated graphics card, we always need to ensure that our video cable is plugged into the graphics card and not the connections on the motherboard. The connections on the motherboard will automatically be disabled once the graphics card's installed, so that can be a common issue as to why your computer's turning on, but we're not getting a display to the screen. Once we've got our cables connected in the right location, it's time to have a quick look at our operating system. We've got our windows installed, we've sat and watched that loading bar go for hours upon hours, but we're in our desktop. End is almost in sight, however, we're not quite there. What we need to do is install all of our drivers. So our drivers are our little pieces of software that allow our computer to interface with the hardware it's connected to. And that gets us the best performance out of all of our components and make sure everything runs harmoniously. Best way to acquire all these drivers is having a look at the motherboard manufacturer's utility. For example, Asus will have Armory Crate, MSI will have MSI Center, Gigabyte will have GCC or Gigabyte Control Center, and ASRock have ASRock's driver utility. What these utilities will assist you with is finding all of the drivers that are necessary for all of your motherboard components and automatically installing them for you in one nice little neat package. Makes life easy. Next thing we'll have to take care of is our graphics card drivers. We obviously want all of the frames we can get, so we need to make sure that software is installed correctly. If we have an NVIDIA graphics card, we have NVIDIA control panel. If we have an AMD graphics card, we have AMD Catalyst. And if we have an Intel graphics card, we have Intel Arc Command Center. A rookie mistake that a couple people encounter when they're trying to install the drivers is going to third-party apps like driver boosters or driver installers. A lot of the time, these will do more harm than good for your computer, and it's always recommended to grab them from a manufacturer's official source. If you want to ensure that all of the drivers are installed on your system correctly, the easiest way to check is our device manager on our computer. There's a couple quick ways to get there, but the easiest way is to go down to your start button, right click, and open up the little tab that says device manager. If you notice any that have a little yellow error code, that means they're probably not installed correctly, and we'll need to go find those from the manufacturer's source. Now we'll quickly wrap this up so you can go enjoy playing games on your fancy new computer. First thing is if you have anything you're unsure of, always read the manual. 
There's no shame in doing this. It is one of the most helpful resources you can find when you're first time building a computer. You can watch as many tutorials as you want, but traditionally your motherboard manual will list all the specific features to your specific system. Secondly, if you're getting a bit tired, a bit frustrated while you're building the system, take a break. There's no harm, there's no hurry. Enjoy the process. It's like building Lego. It's supposed to be an enjoyable process putting this all together, and it's very enjoyable once you see the final product. Last of all, if you ever get stuck and you don't feel confident proceeding, please feel free to drop by to one of our locations, whether it be JW Computers, Bankstown, or Castle Hill. We're all more than happy to help and there'll be no judgment here. We we're all newbies once, so we know what the issues are and what the frustrations are when you're dealing with them. Thank you guys so much for watching. Good luck with the build, have fun, enjoy yourself. And if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Have a lovely day.